Fun fact, there's two other talks here that end with for fun and profit. <laughs> so the lesson learned is no matter how witty you think you are, someone else is gonna, probably going to tell the same joke. <laughs> What's that? Oh, see, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm all about the fun and profit. So. Um, hey, everybody, I'm Mike. So a little about me. Uh, my day job is I'm director of engineering at theclimb.com. We are based in Portland, Oregon. We're an e-commerce vendor. Uh, we have a refreshingly old-fashioned business model. We put stuff in a warehouse, we put the inventory online, people see it, buy it with a credit card, and we ship it to them. It works out pretty well, and we're hiring if that interests you. Um, so during the evenings, though, I, uh, I do a lot of Ruby open source. And uh, so I've done a lot of gyms over the years. My latest project is called Sidekick. I hope, uh, I hope a lot of you have, have heard of it before. If not, we're going to be going into it, into, into detail. So this talk is broken into three parts. I'm going to talk about the basics of async processing, why you want to do it, how we do it, um, maybe some design. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit of design. And then I'll give you some pro tips that uh, you may not think of when you're writing your, your Rails applications, Notch applications, something like that, that can influence uh, how well the async processing works for you. And then the, the, la the last... Uh, Third, I'm going to go into Sidekick and, and dive into its design a little bit and talk about Ruby in general. So why do we want to asynchronously process? Uh, the answer is simple. In a word, it's the user. We, uh, you respect the, user, the user's time by making things work as quickly as possible. You don't want to make the user wait. User gets bored, he goes away, you lose money. So the other... Boy. The other uh, reason is that, is that modern I.O. Is, is very slow. Uh, it's orders of magnitude slower than RAM. So anywhere where we do I.O., we can, uh, we can throw it, we can spin it off into the background and save a lot of time and, uh, and save the, the user a lot of uh, impatience. And also, I.O. is unreliable. Disks die all the time. The network dies all the time. So it... Uh, <laughs> It, it's a good thing if we can do this in the background in a way that's repeatable with, where we can retry if things fail. So, so what do we want to asynchronously process? Ba basically anything optional. Uh, for us Rails guys, that ba basically means anything that's not required to generate the HTTP response, throw it into the background. Uh, it's safer that way so that the user uh, has less potential for seeing 500 errors, and it's also going to be faster. So this is the general idea behind asynchronous processing. Your code is the client. You put some sort of message on a queue that you want to be processed. On the other side, the other end of that queue, there's the server, which pulls the message off and then hands it to some sort of worker to be executed. Really simple, right? So how do we implement this? This is the simplest, most straightforward Ruby I could come up with, which is uh, basically, here's a method. It just asynchronously executes that block. And in fact, the Go language basically does something identical to this. It has a keyword Go, and you just pass it a function, and that function happens in the background. And that's exactly how Go routines work. However, there's a problem here with, with, uh, with how we want to do things, we want to execute this block in another process. We want to spin off that work to some other machine, possibly. And if, how many of you were at Pat's talk yesterday? You, you learned all about what a block is. A block is a closure, right? So basically, that closure can access any variables outside of that block that are in scope. So if we want to execute that block in another process, we have to serialize the entire closure over to that process. And Ruby can't do that. It's just not possible. So, uh, so we can't do that in Ruby. So that's effectively impossible. So, and, and even if we could, that could potentially be hundreds of K or megabytes of data. Just not very efficient. So 
there needs to be a simpler way of saying, execute this block in another process. Well, what if we could, what if we could reference a block by name? Instead of an anonymous block, if we just had a, a name for a block and that, that, that server process knew what that block was, we could just call it by name. And in fact, Ruby has something like this. Uh, you have a, a named block which accepts arguments. Does anyone know what that is? It's a method. You've probably used them before. <laughs> so we can do this. Instead of async processing an anonymous block, we give it an instance, the name of the method we want to call, and a set of arguments to pass to that instance. Now we've, we've got a much simpler problem to solve. We need to, to marshal that instance over the name of the method and marshal the arguments. Ruby can do that. And in effect, that's how the Rails 4 queuing API is going to work. You give it an instance, it marshals the instance over to a separate process, and then calls a method on it. However, the, the, problem, the problem with this is you still have a lot of data that you're gonna marshal. That, that instance could have a lot of data in it, you just don't know. Also, the arguments could be large, they could be full objects themselves, so there could be a lot of data associated with this. Is there some way we can simplify this a bit more? Well, yeah, there is. We could do class methods instead. That takes away the instance. So now we're just calling a method on a class and passing in some simple arguments. That, that solves half of the problem. Now we only need to worry about marshalling the arguments. I just said that. So, congratulations, we've just derived how Rescue and Sidekick work. You are essentially calling class methods uh, in a separate process and passing it arguments. And so this is, uh, this is an example of Sidekick, how you can spin off a method into the background. You just have a class method which takes an argument and then you call dot delay on it and that actually sends the method invocation to the sidekick process to be executed in the background. Pretty simple. Sidekick has another way of doing it, which is through uh, um, a worker. So if you want to encapsulate a particular job within a class, you just provide a perform method which performs that job, and then you call a class method that is the, side, uh, the sidekick API, which is called perform async. Pass it the arguments, and it effectively does the same thing as the previous slide. That actually turns out, it becomes very efficient now. Instead of talking about serializing that, in, that possibly megabyte, megabytes of closure for that anonymous block, now we've simplified things so that we can efficiently just pass in the class name and, and a simple set of arguments. And that message is very efficient, very small. So that brings me to my first Pro tip when doing asynchronous processing. Small stateless messages. Stateless means that the queue is not where your data belongs. Your data belongs in your database. That's why it's called a database. It holds a base that holds data. Your queue contains actions that you want to perform on that data. And so your message really should be perform action X on object Y. That's it. So your, your, uh, your messages should contain object identifiers that you then look up using active record and so that you can uh, then perform that action on that object. You don't want to serialize that entire object onto the queue uh, because then you, your object uh, is sitting in two places. Your user object is, is sitting in the database, but it's also serialized into the queue. Well, what's the problem there? The problem is you get stale data. This is being executed asynchronously. You don't know if it's gonna execute five seconds from now or five hours from now. In the meantime, the user could go and update their data and change things such that when the job is actually executed off of the queue, that data could be out of sync. If the message just contains the identifier, you know that you're always gonna be using the latest version of the data. Simple types. Simple types are easy to read, they're cross-platform, cross and that's why Rescue and Sidekick use JSON. 
because that forces you to use those simple types. JSON does not allow you to serialize a full Ruby object. By doing that, tooling becomes much simpler. You can now inspect the contents of your queue visually and see exactly what arguments you're passing into that method. Instead of passing in a kilobyte or a few kilobytes of binary data, you're just passing in a few simple integers. Now I can pop into Rails console and execute that job myself manually. You can see at the top there, I'm, doing, I'm having to use YAML because I'm actually uh, delaying that class method and technically side, Sidekick um, uh, serializes the entire class over unfortunately because you might have class state. But, uh, but it still is, is reasonably readable as is. Tip number two, we've talked about the client and passing messages. Now on the server side, when you're doing your work, you want your work to be item what's known as idempotent and transactional. Idempotent is a fancy computer science term. It basically means a perform the, perform, performing the action many times will not harm your system. Examples of things that are idempotent, canceling an order. Once you've canceled that order, you can cancel it as many more times as you want. Nothing bad's gonna happen. You update your email address, you change it to bob at example.com. You can continue to update it to bob at example.com, not gonna harm anything. Things that are not item potent. Charging a credit card. You ever gone to the place order screen and it says don't double click? They're not item potent. That's exactly why they put that warning there, is because that developer is lazy and does not know what the word idempotent means. Sending an email is not idempotent. You send an email once, Gmail will happily deliver a second email to that same user with the exact same contents. So why does this matter? This matters because your code has bugs and Sidekick will retry your code if it fails, if it raises an error Sidekick will retry it with an exponential back off. The reason for that is simple. Like I said at the very beginning, IO is unreliable. Networks die. Third party APIs go down all the time. So it's nice to have uh, an asynchronous processor that recognizes that and just will retry it for you. And so if an error is thrown, you see the email and you don't have to get up and do anything because you know five minutes from now Sidekick's gonna retry it and it's gonna succeed. So that means that you need to design your jobs with the idea in mind that this job could be executed many times. So if you're doing a non-item potent action, you need to check to make sure you need to, you need to actually perform that action first. Transact the item potent and transactional are, are sort of similar ideas. This is an example of an of a asynchronous worker if I'm returning an order, I issue credit for that order and then I send them an email saying that their credit was issued. If I issue the credit successfully but then the email blows up because Gmail is down, is Sidekick's gonna keep retrying that? Is they, are they gonna continue to get more and more credit until you, got, until you realize that? Um, that's, up to, uh, that's up to you as a developer to make sure that that doesn't happen. So tip number three, embrace concurrency. The standard for Ruby until recently, I think, has been the single threaded model. I've been trying for the last couple of years to get people to embrace threads. I know the JRuby guys have been trying to get people to embrace threads. The, the Rubinius people, it seems like everyone but MRI is trying to get people to embrace threads. Um, and so people who have been using rescue and delayed job, which are the, pretty much the standards for asynchronous processing these days, it's, it's common to have a handful, maybe a dozen workers, and that's, that's not terribly concurrent. Um, so concurrency is not something you really need to think about too much. You're not gonna crush your database by having 10 extra processes, 10 extra connections hitting it. But Sidekick is heavily multi-threaded. Every process has 25 threads in it. 
by default, and you can, you can up that to a lot more. So if you're running four processes, you've got 100 workers, and you've got potentially 100 threads hitting your database all at once. Same thing goes with any third-party APIs you're hitting. So Sidekick, in fact, goes from being a, a, a nice, polite character to being Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> And, and Sidekick will, will crush servers. It'll take, it'll take down servers that you, or services that you haven't uh, prepared for. We rolled out Sidekick in production at the climb about six months ago, and within 48 hours, we had taken down a, a third-party API that we were calling um, because we just we pushed 500 jobs onto the queue, and it processed them all at once, and that server was not prepared for 500 connections. So, uh, so concurrency is something you need to think about when you have that volume of work, that, that number of workers and that volume of jobs. There's a couple things you can do. Uh, you can use a connection pool so that your processes are limited in the number of connections they can make to that service. You can also mix parallel and serial execution and, and blend them together. So instead of, if you've got 100 items to process, instead of creating 100 jobs, you can create 10 jobs which each process 10 items serially. And that way, you've only got 10 workers hitting that server. In my experience over the last year um, dealing with, with Sidekick is that thread safety has not been much of an issue. I've found three gyms, I think, that had thread safety issues. And we use about 150 gyms at the climb. So it's a very small percentage. Um, cocaine and Typhus were the, the last ones that had thread safety fixes put in. Uh, the base camp gym is also not thread safe, but I was able to fix that myself. But for the most part, gym maintainers are responsive. And if they're not responsive, that's a sign you probably shouldn't be using that gym at all anyways. So that's a little bit of the theory and some pro tips around asynchronous processing. Let's talk about Sidekick and Ruby and, and the innards. So Sidekick's mantra is simple, efficient mes message processing. It's multi-threaded rather than single-threaded. So it is 10, 20 times faster than something like delayed job or rescue. And that's, that's the reality, is that modern Ruby isn't terribly slow. You can do a lot of work if you have the right design. It's, it's single threading that's killing us as a, as a community. To scale a single threaded model, you need to create lots of processes. That works fine when you're gluing together little command line Unix utilities, as was Ruby's history 10 years ago. It does not work fine today in the era of 300 megabyte Rails processes. Okay, this is an example from the Climbs production server. We've got five unicorns running at about 250 to 300 megabytes each. Each one of those can handle one request at a time. That's pathetic. At the same time, right next to it, I've got a sidekick running with 10 workers, 10 worker threads taking 250 megs of memory. So sidekick's doing, effectively, can do twice as much work while being the same size as one of those unicorns. To put some numbers in front of you, 400 megabytes, you want 25 requests processed at a time. That's 10 gigs, 10 gigs of RAM. That's an EC2 extra large instance. That's $480 a month. If on the other hand you use threads, one, one gigabyte of RAM, let's say, that fits onto an EC2 small for $60 a month. One of the earliest Sidekick customers was on, had 160 dinos of rescue and he switched to Sidekick and went down to 10 dinos. And a dino costs $35 a month. He's saving $5,000 a month in hosting costs alone just by switching. So that's the inefficiency I'm talking about. That's why I say Sidekick is efficient, because it saves real money at scale. So I was a little bit disappointed yesterday at Ruby 2.0's feature set. When I think of 2.0, I think of a major version increment that breaks things for the better. 
And I was really hoping to see some concurrency changes take place. Uh, specifically, we need to get rid of the gill. And, and we've, we've got terrible GC. And all this, I think, in my opinion, and my understanding is, a lot of this is just simply hampered by the C extension API that continues to linger on. And so the GC and the gill are there to deal with C ex extensions. Which is, is kind of funny because the C extensions are there to speed up performance. Right? With a C extension, I can take my well-tuned Ruby and maybe make it 50% faster. But now I can't eight, use seven other cores. So what's, what's bigger, 50% faster or 800% faster? That's, that's the sad state is, uh, of where we are today, I think. So Sidekick internals, the client, got, we've got your Rails process with, with your app code. You call the Sidekick client API. Sidekick has a concept of middleware. There's a pipeline that messages flow through from your code before they're pushed onto Redis. This allows us to add, uh, in the same way that Rack middleware allows us to add features to Rails, allows you to add features to Sidekick. Sidekick. So there's a client middleware pipeline which is executed, and then once it flows through the middleware, it's serialized into JSON and placed into Redis. On the server side, the Sidekick server um, uses Celluloid. I know that Celluloid's gotten a lot of, a lot of love so far, um, and I'm the first person to admit to be a, another fanboy of it. But um, Celluloid really makes, makes it easy to, to deal with the multi-threading here. Um, I've got three actors in Sidekick. There's a fetcher, which just simply listens for, on cues and fetches messages off of those cues. He hands the messages to the manager, and the manager is who keeps track of all the processors. So the processors are the guys that do all the heavy lifting and do execute all your work. So you're gonna have 25, 50, processors within your sidekick process. They each execute the server middleware with your message. Again, that server middleware can, can modify the message or simply stop the message from getting processed. But once it flows through the, the middleware pipeline, it's passed to a worker whereupon it gets executed. And that's, that's where your co code is called and, and the work is actually done. Conceptually, it's pretty simple. So there's two versions of Sidekick. There is the base Sidekick, which is free, open source, uh, LGPL license. There's also Sidekick Pro. Uh, it has more features and it costs money. I charge for it. And Matt yesterday talked about motivation and he talked about love and altruism. Love and altruism only gets you so far. Um, I, think, I think money is a great motivator too. So I like to have customers. So uh, as long as the money keeps flowing in, I, I'm going to be happy to support Sidekick. In terms of feature sets, again, in terms of concurrency models, Sidekick uses threads, the other two use processes. Uh, I like Redis, uh, Rescue's use of Redis. I love Redis as a data store. Um, one of the most frequent questions I get is, can I use Mongo or Cassandra or React or MySQL or Postgres to store my data? And my answer is always the same, no. No. I don't want to make a lowest common denominator storage API and abstract all that just so a few people can run on Mongo or whatever. Redis is awesome. It's got all sorts of cool data structures that, and I leverage pretty much all of them for the features in Sidekick. So to port to something like a database would be uh, very difficult. I like the middleware design rather than callbacks, so that's what Sidekick uses. And uh, as I said before, Sidekick aims to be simple and efficient. Part of that simple phrasing is gathering together all the features I think 90% of us use all the time. One of the things that disappoints me about Rescue is I think the feature set is a little bit bare bones out of the box. A lot of people, if you, if you how many people here use Rescue? Okay, so about half the audience. Um, how many of you don't use add-on gems that add on additional functionality to rescue? 
Yeah, nobody. Um, there is a lot missing from rescue that I really missed. A delayed job has a lot of functionality built into it. Uh, a scheduler, the retry, the retry mechanism, um, a web UI, the, the uh, delaying of class methods and that sort of thing. All, I use that stuff every day. And uh, that's why, I, in terms of simplicity, I build it all in so that it's well designed and all works together well. So the future of Sidekick, uh, I just checked in. I actually just released 2.5, which has a nicer web UI. I, I still think it can be cleaned up a little bit, but I want to add more functionality to it. Uh, I just actually in 2.5 also released APIs for managing queues and retries, so, so that's there. But the big one on the horizon is the Rails 4 queue API. The, the, the day that that API is solidified and supported, there'll be a Sidekick release which supports that, a, that API also. So rest assured, Sidekick will, will move forward with Rails 4. Uh, Sidekick Pro, I'm just gonna add enterprise features. Uh, Sidekick is where functionality for 90% of you goes. Sidekick Pro is where functionality for 30% of you might go. That's the optional stuff. That's the enterprise-y type stuff. Stuff that maybe hobbyists don't necessarily care about. So, to wrap up, I gave you those three tips. Small stateless messages, idempotent transactional work, and embrace that concurrency. Uh, and then Sidekick is a different design from, I think, what Ruby has been offering in the past. Uh, and I hope more people uh, learn it, understand it, and embrace it. And that is it for me. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Right there. White yeah. So Sidekick's very cool. You, you mentioned your release 2.5. Do you have any plans to like be able to remove a job from the schedule queue? The API allows you to do that now. The new API? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, programmatically. Or you're, you're not talking from the web UI, are you? No, programmatically. Yeah, it's, it's in 2.5 now. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I love Psychic. use it a lot. Um, uh, so the uh, asynchronous processes, you recommend getting up at the record or your data store to get, to get the uh, associated with them? Yes. Um, what, what have you seen, or what are your, with your knowledge of like any sort of performance impacts that has? Um, the well, typically, typically you're passing identifiers over, uh, and so that's going to be a lookup by primary key. And as long as you've got a buffer pool, uh, everything cached in, in your buffer pool, that's going to be super fast. Um, so I, I wouldn't think that there's going to be much of a performance impact. I would be much more worried um, about, about stale state than, than I would be about the performance impact. I have a, a real time problem processes, and uh, those those jobs are made in a synchronous. But uh, I'm I'd like to know if using fibers with Sidekick is a good option. They have a good integration. There's nothing that I do that is fiber ad adverse. You can use fibers. Um, Sidekick jobs are executed within a thread, and a thread can run as many fibers as it wants. So there's no reason to think why you couldn't use fibers with whatever functionality you want. Shouldn't, shouldn't be a compatibility issue or anything like that. Back there. Yep. Yes, um, just like you, uh, we really like currency, and uh, we're getting ready to productionalize our Rails app. We use a lot of gems. Is there a way to know that those gems are thread safe or there's some website or is there a way to determine if all my threads are, or if all my gems are thread safe? Um, I'd say that's pretty much equivalent to the halting problem. Uh, that is to say, it's not really computable. No, I mean the. My experience has been, if you're using popular, well-supported gems, you're not going to you're not going to have much of a problem. Sidekick actually did find a Rails threading problem in 3.328 that is fixed in 3.2.9. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's, very, it's very rare. Kind of like unit testing, you can unit test your code all you want, but until you actually click through stuff, you don't know it's actually gonna work, right? 
So you've got to still load test your, your, uh, your subsystems, uh, and only that way are you going to be able to determine if, if this thing is reasonably stable. Um, I've often found uh, when I'm using both Rescue and Sidekick that uh, I'm breaking a lot of big jobs down into small, more atomic ones. Um, I was just wondering, speaking practically, uh, do you have any advice for how to track those? Like, I often struggle to report back um, for things that initiated the job. Uh, so, in other words, you've got one process which is creating a thousand jobs, and then you want to report back when all thousand are done? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what Sidekick Pro does. Okay. It has the concept of a batch where you create those thousand jobs within a batch, and then when the batch is done, it, you can notif be notified on it. But again, that's one of those pro features that, that I charge for. Hmm? Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, the, not saying it's been a big, big problem, but you mentioned sending email is, yeah, you, you could uh, send, send the same email several times. What's your pro tip to avoid doing that? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. So one of my slides, I'll show you real quick, uh, had a comment that sort of showed a safer way to do this. So when you're issuing credit and then you actually try to deliver that email, that network could be down, right? And so the email will raise an exception and you might issue them credit over and over and over. What is safer is to spin off that email delivery as its own separate job. And so you're doing that email delivery as an atomic job where that's all that job does. So if it fails, there was no email sent. But if it succeeds, you know the email was sent. And that's all you, and so by doing that, uh, you take away a lot of the, uh, the risk. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree, it takes away a lot of the risk, mm -hmm. and I would do it that way, but it doesn't eliminate the risk because you can, you can send an email through uh, an SMTP connection and then you botch up the, the hang up and you decide, oh no, I didn't manage to do that. Whereas the receiving side says, yeah. oh yeah, I've received that. Yeah. You know, at that point, all you can do is really mark, uh, you can store some state saying, yes, I sent this email. That's really all, all, all that I can think of you can do offhand is just mark a flag that said this was done. Any other questions? Yeah, back there. I'm sorry? Right. Right. Uh, someone actually asked for that feature, and uh, I started implementing it. But there's an implementation detail that I have not worked out how to deal with yet. So currently, the answer is no. Yeah. Uh, do you have any measurements to see what sort of scaling curve we get by using Rescue with MRI one eye versus on I mean, It's not current credit, but still might be able to uh, crank some more stuff and uh, reduce process size. Do you mean sidekick or rescue? Sidekick. Okay. Uh, I, I did do some basic performance testing on JRuby, on JRuby uh, to test the number of client messages I could push onto a queue uh, in JRuby versus 193. And JRuby was something like twice as fast. It could push about t twice as many messages. So it's, uh, the performance is definitely there. But, uh, but I haven't done, on, unfortunately, on the multi-threaded side, no, I haven't. It's, it's so hard to get a real-world benchmark of, you know, you, there's no such thing as a micro-benchmark for a background worker system, unfortunately. Way in the back. Um, so as one of the few uh, truly threaded uh, components of any movie I've ever worked with, Well, I, Rails does, does uh, is not thread adverse, I should say. It's not Rails' job to create the threads and, and execute things. That's, that's your, um, your application server. So um, 
So things like unicorn versus rainbows. Unicorn is single-threaded. Rainbows, you can choose to use a thread pool to execute, uh, to execute Rails. Um, if you're using uh, JRuby, you can use Trinidad, and it'll, it'll spin up a thread pool to handle requests. Um, and again, Rails doesn't care about that. All, all Rails knows is it's handling a re request on this thread. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the issue is, is that you do have some trade-offs there. Uh, there is some developer happiness trade-offs. Uh, JRuby is, is super fast in production, uh, and, and I think it's a great project. Uh, but there, there still remains some developer happiness problems. You know, they got startup, startup problems, uh, startup time issues, as always. Um, and that's just due to the, the JVM. There's not much they can do about that. Uh, I'm sure they've done as much as they can to, uh, to minimize that. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, thread safety also requires you to turn off auto-loading so you don't get the, the benefit of uh, reloading your, or hitting control R and, and reloading your browser on every request. Uh, so, you know, it's a trade-off. People, people just need to be aware of those trade-offs and, and make their own decision. Yeah. Um, Cycle Pro, it's about $500 per month. I think that makes sense for a business, but it's not, not per month, just oh, yeah, for a license. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but is there also a, a trial for that? Can no, you, no. Okay. No refunds as well. No, no trials, no refunds. It's, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm selling a product and I'm giving people the opportunity to, su to support me in my efforts and my open source. And uh, if people choose to avail themselves of that, great, I'll, I'm going to do my best to support you. Uh, Sidekick's still there. It's free. It's open source. It's LGPL. If you're happy with that and you just want to use that, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. I'm curious about what your retry would look like. Um, specifically, how often you retry? So the retry is almost identical to delayed job. Delayed job has the same sort of idea. Uh, and in fact, I stole the exact formula that they use to calculate how often you retry. It basically retries uh, with an exponential back off. So if it blows up, it'll retry 15 seconds from now. And then with every additional iteration, it, it lengthens the time that it retries. And it retries for about three weeks, or 25 total retries. Um, and what's great about that system is that if you, if it blows up, uh, you know, I assume everyone's got AirBrake or Exceptional or something integrated into their, their Rails app. I hope you do at least. Uh, if you get an email saying that there was a bug and your worker blew up, you just go in, you fix the bug, you push a new release. Sidekick will retry it eventually. You don't care when, right? You don't, you don't have any state in that message, right? Because you followed my pro tips. So uh, the problem just sort of goes away in having to rerun that job. Any other questions? All right, thank you.